so this is the second part talking about orbits based on observations. So, you know, the astronomers of the past had their telescope and they took positions of the stars and the planets and they sort of plotted them out. And this is what they sort of came up with with orbits. And like I said in the previous video, they didn't necessarily know why the celestial bodies traveled this way, but this is what they said, this is how it happens. And when I say they, I mean Kepler and Tycho and, and people like that. Okay, so if you just take a 2D orbit and every orbit can be, because it's in space and there's no like off axis, like gravity only acts between two bodies, um, all orbits can be flattened onto a 2D plane, regardless of how you look at it, especially since uh, planets are, are, spe are basically spheres. You can look at it at an angle and look at it as a 2D surface. So I'm gonna use this clipboard to sort of represent this is my planar orbit and I'm traveling around it like this. I'm gonna have two foci for an ellipse. One foci is gonna be here and that's gonna be the center of the planet that I'm traveling around. And here's my satellite. My satellite has some velocity vector and some radius from that center of mass there. The uh, orbit as an ellipse has a perigee, so the point closest to it, and an apogee, the point farthest away from it. And you've probably heard this before, but you know, angular momentum, which is r crossed with v, is a constant. And so if I am closer to the orbit, I need to travel faster. So my fastest velocity is when I'm close, and then my slowest velocity is when I'm far away. So you've probably heard of like Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet comes in hot, shoots around the sun, and then flies back away and comes back 75 years later because it's just really taking a long time because it's traveling super slow um, out here. Um, you can take this orbit and you can write the total mechanical energy. You've got kinetic energy and potential energy. As you get closer, you're essentially uh, falling into um, the, uh, the, the planet, and so R is getting smaller, and so your potential energy is getting larger, um, so that would be uh, gaining potential energy. Uh, it's kind of a, it, it, a weird way to think of it, because we think of potential energy as like MGH, and as we gain altitude, we're gaining energy. Um, but this is a, we're, we're in space and things kind of work differently. Like if you're trying to rendezvous in space, like you actually need to um, come down in your orbit so that you accelerate. Um, so that's why, and, and, and by the way, there's also a minus sign here. So even though this term is getting larger, um, your entire mechanical energy is, uh, is, is going down. Okay. Your kinetic energy is just your one half V squared. There's no mass in there because if you remember in the last um, video I showed, it was uh, F equals MA. The M is on the gravitational law has mass of the satellite in it, and then in the right hand side, it's M mass times acceleration, so the mass cancels out. And so you're just left with mu, which remember mu is G times the gravitational constant times mass of the Earth. And then, uh, so again, you have the kinetic energy and the potential energy here. So as you're traveling around, you have some other parameters that you can look at. So the radius r is equal to this equation p over one plus e cosine v. There's a lot of variables in there. p is your semi-lattice uh, term, e is your eccentricity, and v is this anomaly here. So I, didn't, I forgot to write this down, but v can be any number from zero to two pi, right? If v is zero, you're here at perigee. If v is equal to pi, you're at apogee, and if two pi, you're all the way around. Um, so if you look at this, right, like if v equals zero, your perigee is p over one plus e, and if v is pi, cosine of pi is negative one, and you get p over one minus e. e is your eccentricity, which tells you how eccentric or elongated your orbit is. If e is equal to zero, this whole term drops out, and r is just equal to p which means R is always equal to your semi-lattice value, which means that your perigee and your apogee are constant. At, at that point, like you, you have no apogee and perigee because it's a circle. And so if E is equal to zero, you have a circle. If E is anywhere between zero and one, you have an ellipse. Once you have E equal to one, 
you have a parabola, and that's an orbit that's going to look like this. So you're going to—that's like a slingshot maneuver. You're not going to get captured by the planet. You're just going to slingshot past it. And then if e is greater than one, you have a hyperbola. So that's even farther. If you remember your conic sections from um, from grade school, um, that's those are your 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 conic sections there: circle, ellipse, parabola, hyperbola. You got one more uh, equation here: p is equal to a times one minus e squared where A is your semi-major axis. And by the way, if you're wondering where all these equations come from, they come from geometry. Um, there, there's no uh, calculus or uh, you know, numerical integration or anything like that. Um, this is all conservation of energy and, and conic sections and geometry. That's, that's how they figured this out. Uh, it's kind of impressive how they all figured this out, uh, you know, I guess 450 years ago now. Okay. So for, given all these parameters that I've given you, for every orbit, you have uh, two degrees of freedom, really. You have the eccentricity of the orbit, and then you have what's called the longitude of the ascending node, which is where the perigee is. So if you imagine this is my, this is my orbit like this, Right now, my perigee is pointing to the right, but I could easily have an orbit that looks like this, where perigee, the, the planet is still in the same spot, but the perigee is pointing upwards, right? So you have this eccentricity term, which sort of increases and decreases your, um, the elongation of your orbit, and then you have the longitude of the ascending node, which sort of rotates your orbit around. And I probably need to include one more parameter, and that's A, this is a horrible marker, which is your semi-major axis. And that increases and decreases your orbit, um, or the size of your orbit. So you, if you, you can actually go on Wikipedia or any website, NASA, JPL, whatever, and it'll tell you the semi-major semi axis of the Earth and the semi-major axis of any of the planets in the solar systems, including Pluto. Um, so you can kind of look at what these distances are. Now, we live in three dimensions, and so this two-dimensional orbit, yes, we can elongate it, we can scale it up, and we can rotate it, but eventually we need to get into 3D orbits. This figure is really, really hard to, to digest, I think, and so I'm going to try and uh, break it down here. This XY plane is a, what I call the, this, this two-dimensional plane. And if I take my orbit and I choose a semi-major axis, and I choose a um, longitude of ascending node, and I choose a eccentricity, I'm gonna have an orbit that has some elongation in the plane. It's gonna have some size to it from the semi-major axis, and it's gonna have some rotation angle that is going to get me to my um, longitude of ascending node. Now the interesting thing about the longitude of ascending node is it's actually measured from the, the x-axis, which is called the vernal equinox, to what's called the n, which is n hat, which is called the line of nodes. And so what happens is, is that if you take your orbit, so you are at some position with some eccentricity and some line of nodes, and if you rotate about the z-axis, you have some non-zero line of nodes. At that point, because you're in 3D, you get one more degree of freedom, which is called the inclination, and you actually rotate the orbit about that um, line of nodes, and now your eccentricity vector is actually out of the plane. Your perigee, let me get a better marker here, your perigee is still here, RP, and your apogee is now down here, RA, and remember, this apogee is below the plane. I, I had a hard time drawing this. But think about it as a rotation where you have your planar orbit, you rotate to a certain line of nodes, and then you rotate about the line of nodes to something called the inclination. And the inclination is measured from the, sorry, that's an H. I apologize. That is an H. H is your angular momentum vector. So remember, you're, if even right now, this is, in, this is in 3D, but if I look at it from this axis, 
my orbit is still 2D. And that is going to have some angular momentum vector that's sticking out, and that angular momentum vector is constant, all right, because of the conservation of angular momentum and energy. And so what's happening is, is I'm trading mechanical energy for potential energy as I'm going through this orbit, but I'm still in 2D with this constant h vector. And the angle between that h vector and my z axis is my inclination. And so if I have an inclination of zero, that means I'm in an equatorial orbit. And so I can have an equatorial circular orbit, which means I would have no line of nodes because again, there's no apogee or perigee and my inclination would be zero. But then I could take that circular orbit and rotate it, in which case I would have some uh, finite inclination. If I elongated it, at that point I would have some eccentricity and a line of nodes. And I could, my orbit could rotate in all those directions. So you have this sort of three degrees of freedom where you can have any orbit in any axis um, in, in three dimensional space. I hope I explained that well. If you are uh, confused about it, um, I recommend Googling a, a book called Fundamentals of Astrodynamics by Baker. It was written in the 70s, and at this point, it's open source. Um, it is a great resource. Uh, the great thing about math is that it does not change, and so the dynamics of orbits and Kepler's laws have also not changed in 400 years. And so all of these equations are in that book. Uh, again, Fundamentals of Astrodynamics. Uh, I highly recommend uh, going through the first two chapters if this is unclear. Um, as always, you can post in the comments, and I'll try and help you there. Hope you have a good one.